For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The Apostle Paul stood in the midst of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens at the Areopagus. So we heard this week in our congregation of prayer. These men, these philosophers, were the intellectuals of the day, whose reason and logic could run circles around what we call critical thinking today. And Paul was sent to them by our Lord Jesus with a message, a message that Paul calls, according to the philosopher, foolishness and a stumbling block. So it is that if Paul plays their game on their turf, It's not going to go well. What these men, the most brilliant intellects of their day, know cannot be refuted by their means, by their methodology. They've arrived at their conclusions, they hold to them steadfastly, and they'll debate endlessly with you about whose philosophy, that is, love of wisdom, is the most truthful, the most beneficial for daily life. These philosophers, Stoics and Epicureans, amongst others, are still arguing about who is right even today. So Paul doesn't play their game. He begins his sermon with a truth bomb. He says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. He gets it right. These men are brilliant, but their philosophy makes them very religious. They are reverent, they're devoted, they're absolutely committed to really what is their faith tradition. They do what they believe their gods want from them, whether their gods are themselves, in the case of the Epicureans, or their god is the divine Logos, that of the Stoics. These philosophers, like all people, have a code, an ethic, a moral framework, and they're absolutely committed to it, and they'll fiercely defend it, even religiously. But as we heard this week, seeing an altar with an inscription to the unknown God, Paul perceives an opportunity. Rather than address the world and their life and all things in the ways that they do, that is, according to what they can feel and touch and taste and smell and sense, what they can suss out according to their reason, Paul confesses the unknown God, and he tells them exactly who it is, the Creator Father, the Savior Son, and the Life Giver Spirit. Paul speaks not of the gods who they have found in their own nature, or the gods that they have fashioned with their hands after their desires of their own heart or after themselves. Paul speaks of the eternal, knowable God who reveals himself throughout history in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The one they call the unknown God has made himself known in Jesus. So, God the Holy Trinity is not distant but is and has always been intimately near, despite their stubborn refusal and the refusal of all mankind to acknowledge him. At the most, these Athenian philosophers will just give a nod and a wink to this god of the gaps, calling him the unknown god. But actually, that's how all mankind from Adam have preferred their gods or God to be. Somewhat distant, abstract, really not knowable. If you can keep God at arm's length from you, well then, he really won't be all that demanding. He won't be too difficult for you. He won't offend you. So on the one hand, if you can do this, this allows your life to be lived according to Well, without really any kind of constraint, without 
a God-ordained code of conduct or any moral framework given to you. We call them irreligious today, but they're still religious because they intuitively know that if they got too near to God, if they found or if they really dealt with God as he's revealed himself in the scriptures and as he delivers himself to you in the divine service, well, that would be uncomfortable. So instead, he's going to reveal, if you, if you allow him, reveal hidden faults. He would convict of wrongdoing. He would accuse of moral shortcomings and failures. But let's not have that. But of course, God is not going to allow this to be, not forever. He won't allow you to be who you want to be, but he's going to shake up heaven and earth obtrusively getting into your life. You can say the mantra of this age all you want, and it won't make any difference. It's my life, it's my body, it's my choice, it's my desires, and nothing you, God, are going to say is going to change that. But it doesn't stop people from trying. On the other hand, if you're not one of these licentious, liberal, progressive sort, who think that they can live a life apart from God, and do whatever the hell they want, because that's where it leads, after all, hell. It's possible, actually, to keep God at a distance and still be very religious. Now, that's the preferred approach for conservative Christians. We can acknowledge and confess God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, give a nod and wink to the revelation of Holy Scriptures, and even to... Jesus' own institutions of preaching and teaching, absolution, baptism, and the supper, those are all good and appropriate at times. Put God's word into a box, limit it, limit to maybe just an hour each week, not really applying it to our day-to-day -day life and our vocations in this world. Forgiveness, that really only belongs in the church. Forgiveness doesn't belong in marriage or in the workplace or in the classroom or especially in civil society. That's the approach of conservative Christians. We fence Jesus off from most of our lives so that we're free, not really, to fill in whatever religious ideas and practices work best. So just like those Epicureans and Stoics, we can live a very religious life with faith in Christ and alongside the same time live completely contrary to what he has said. Devise a religious scheme for our own choosing to govern our day-to-day -day life. Now, you might not think I'm telling the truth on this, but think about it. Maybe you're religiously devoted to your family, willing to do anything to make them happy and content. But what happens when the religious service that Christ has set up, the divine service, gets in the way of your religious service to your family? But for others, they're workaholics. They're religiously devoted to work, spending every waking moment thinking about how to get the next break, to capture the big fish, to get the crops in on time. What are you going to do when a perfect opportunity arrives right in your lap on Sunday morning? See the conflict? And maybe you're religiously devoted to the pleasures of this world. I just can't give that up. I enjoy what I enjoy, Pastor. But what happens when Jesus speaks clearly and directly against those pleasures? We've got competing religions. They can't run side by side. You can be completely religious and still not have what it takes to live in Christ, now and especially eternally. What's really the problem here is religiosity. That's not what's actually needed. Zeal and dedication and commitment, living according to a code of conduct, those are all good, but that's not really what this is all about today. If, that's, if that were true, then... Those Stoics and Epicureans, they'd be right alongside us, walking through the gates of heaven, 
They lived a moral and upstanding life, committed to their cause, to their faith. If that were also true, then the most religious and devout people in the world would be saved, especially because they're so persistent and dedicated. And those we met in today's gospel, the Pharisees and the scribes. See, like Paul with those philosophers in Athens at the Areopagus, Jesus, too, faced the most committed and zealous religious people in Israel. Yes, they, too, were very religious. Maybe a different religion, but still, very religious. And it would seem to us, actually, in all the right ways, because unlike those philosophers that we met this week in our congregation at prayer, these scribes and Pharisees, they have what we call the Old Testament. They followed the law, the Torah, and the prophets. They knew the Psalms. They prayed them daily. They read their scriptures and religiously followed their prescriptions. They'd be considered by us the most conservative, devoted people, maybe something like the Amish or the Hasidic Jew, whose righteousness, their right way of living, let's be honest, would run circles around yours. But here's the problem. They're just like those philosophers. They keep God at a distance. Yes, they have received and taken God's word of law, but again, they've done the same. They've boxed it in, framed it, focused it, restated it, so that it could be doable and keepable, practical. So they would be righteous in themselves. So they think, as you've heard, I'm sure many times, that doing the law is what saves you. Disregarding God's promises to be saved by him. The promise made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and the rest. It's true that these very religious people have a use for God. But only so far as his word supports what they want to believe, what they want to think, and what they want to do. We have a contemporary practical example. They're like the supposed devout politician who claims that he trusts in Christ Jesus, but at the same time supports with rhetoric, policy, and finances the slaughter of innocent children in the womb. You cannot be a Christian and in any way support such a practice. Fifth commandment, after all. But think about it. The politician there has put God in his box. Religion is a private application. It doesn't apply to public life. And so, yes, I'll nod my head at the fifth commandment, but it really doesn't apply to a civil society. Remember the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. So there, again, the Torah is only as useful as far as we want it to be. What's really mistaken by either the philosophy of the Stoics and Epicureans or the religiosity of those scribes and Pharisees is what God is about with his word, what he is accomplishing. He's accomplishing with this word of law a wholesale, complete transformation of you and all who will listen. He says, for I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the most religious scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus isn't content with hypocrites, half-baked Christians. He's not content even with the most religious, the most observant among you. His word isn't given as a guide for your religion that will make you happy or maybe what you think you need to do to make God happy with you. He describes his word as a devastating fire, a whirlwind, something that purges the old leaven, that separates out the dross from the silver, that kills, kills the old Adam. That's what his word's supposed to do, not make you more religious, 
Because when his law is done with you, there will be nothing left but dust and ashes. He'll leave you with nothing to say, but who is going to save me from this body of death? So Jesus, by his word of law, takes all your self-appointed religion and distortions of that word. He takes them all into his body. He suffers them, and he dies for it all on his cross. Rather than you find religion that suits your heart, Jesus finds you and gives you his heart. He reveals to you the known God. Not just the God who devastates you with his word of law, but he reveals himself to you as the God who loves you. Loves you so much that he'll suffer the just penalty for your sin and die. And then open up himself to you fulfilling all of his promises. That's the right understanding of God's word of law. And that's what the Father has been using the law and the prophets for from the very beginning. Shaking heaven and earth, sifting out the wheat from the tares to bring you and all his elect to faith in Christ Jesus. He gives to you, then, life and gives to you to move and to have your being, but it's not in yourself. It's not in your religious observance. It's in Christ Jesus, who is given to you. It comes to you most especially to forgive you of your most and very religious observance. And that's what's going on here today. Giving you that faith that trusts in him. As here... He serves you, not the other way around. This is the divine service, God's service, where he gives himself to you, he speaks to you, he enlightens you, he makes you holy, he forgives you, and thereby you have salvation. This faith that he gives doesn't shy away from what God has to say, not a word of it, not a jot, not a tittle. It lets God's word have its way with you day by day sometimes making you uncomfortable, always accusing you, the law, but always forgiving you in Jesus Christ. This faith does not seek your own righteousness, not by your thinking, doing, philosophizing, or observing, but instead grants you to trust in the righteousness that you have in Christ and in the forgiveness of sins in him. And so this faith doesn't need to join sides or play team sport like the philosophers, Stoics versus Epicureans or scribes versus Pharisees. Instead, all are gathered together in one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and fed together with Christ, one body and blood. And here's the kicker. God in Christ, having given you all of this, means that you have all righteousness, all of his righteousness, a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees because it's Christ's righteousness given to you daily in the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. We stand.